Open your Bibles, please, to 2 Kings chapter 5. We're in a series called Elisha God's Miracle Man. Elisha God's Miracle Man. All of our teaching is available online, either at our church website, capitalbible.com, or at our YouTube channel, which is also called Capital Bible. On the church website, we not only have the videos, but we have the notes. The sermon notes are available, and we have about five or six years worth up there if you ever care to uh, study any of these messages in depth, you can find the teaching notes there along with the videos. Second Kings chapter 5. We're looking today at the subject overcoming prejudice. Overcoming prejudice. Something that, of course, none of us think we have. But we all do because we're humans. So, I need to say, if the shoe fits, or if your phone's ringing, okay, pick it up. It's going to be the Holy Spirit, not me. I didn't write the Bible, I just teach it and preach it. It isn't my job to have people like the Bible or like the preaching. And by the way, this is not an apology, this is just a statement of fact. I don't ever apologize for preaching and teaching God's Word, but sometimes it's a shock to people because they're not used to hearing the truth from a pulpit. And I thank God there are many pulpits across America that still preach and teach truth. I got that. I understand it. We're not, I'm not the only one. I know that. Okay. Now, we're going to look at the story. It's a true story. And see what God did through Elisha for a Syrian commander. And then we're going to apply it and see what the teaching is concerning prejudice and barriers that we allow to get in our way. Second Kings chapter 5, and I'm just going to start to read the story and talk about it as we read the story. There's an outline in your bulletin, by the way, in the center. If you care to take any notes or jot down any of these corroborating scriptures. Now, Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Syria. That's Syria like Syria today. Okay, I want you to, to get what we're talking about. And he was a great and honorable man. Naaman was. In the eyes of his master, that's the king of Syria, because by him, Naaman, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty Man of valor, but a leper. Naaman was a great man. He was a great soldier. He was a great warrior. But he had a problem. He had a disease. It was called leprosy. There's no cure for leprosy. Naaman reminds me of every single person that's born into the human race. Because we're all born with a disease called sin. By the way, sin is incurable. It's incurable, incur humanly speaking. Sin is. And there's great, great gospel parallels to this entire story. And that's not going to be my primary message today. But I can't, uh, I can't not see the gospel parallel. The Bible says in verse 2 that at this time Syrian raiders had invaded the land of Israel. Among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. So this little Jewish girl, this Israeli girl, is captured from her homeland. 
by the Syrian raiders. And she is given as a servant to the wife of Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army. I wonder what you and I would feel like in relation to the nationality or race of people who had kidnapped us and taken us away from our homeland, away from our family, and made us be a slave or a servant in another country. Notice how she responds in verse 3. One day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would die of the leprosy. He deserves to die. Slave girl, okay. I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He, the prophet, would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Watch what the king said. Verse 5, go and visit the prophet. King of Syria told Naaman, I'll send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying his gifts, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, with this letter I present my servant Naaman, I want you to heal him of his leprosy. <laughs> the king of Syria sends that letter to king of Israel. I'm sending this man as a good friend of mine. He's got a disease, leprosy. I want you to heal him. When the king of Israel read the letters, the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay. He said, this man that sends me a leper to heal, am I God that I can give life and take it away? I can see he's just trying to pick a fight with me. You can see how kings would feel that way, can't you? But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he'll learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. Now you get this, get the setting? General, commander-in-chief of the armies of Syria with all of his retinue. He had bodyguards and other people travel. He wasn't there by himself. They drive up to the house of Elisha. And it's obvious that there's a crowd there. So what's Elisha do? Verse 10. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored. You'll be healed of your leprosy. Elisha didn't even go out to see him. Now, that was not because Elisha was prejudiced. If he was prejudiced, he would have said, go jump in the lake. And no good will come out of it. That's what he would have done if he's prejudiced. Okay? Naaman, when he heard this news, watch what he did. He became angry and stalked away. And watch this. I thought... See how Naaman says that? I thought. That's the way a lot of people react to what God says. I think. I think that God should just let everybody go to heaven as long as they're sincere in their belief. I thought that this should be done such and such a way. Frankly, friends, it doesn't matter what you and I think when it comes to eternal truth and God's truth. It only matters what God says. I thought he'd come out to meet me. I thought he'd wave his hand over the leprosy and call in the name of the Lord his God and heal me. 
Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Amana, and the Farpar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why couldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. He didn't like what God said he had to do through his servant Elisha to be healed of his disease. And a lot of people today don't like what God says you have to do to have your sins washed away. A lot of people say, well, I think as long as you do the best you can and live a good life, that certainly someday you'll stand in front of God, and if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then I think God will let you in. That's what I think. And God says, there is no salvation in any other way because there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved than the name of Jesus, Acts 4.12. His officers, verse 13, tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says, simply go and wash and be cured. People want to work their way to heaven so they can feel like they deserve it. So they can feel like they earned it, right? And that's why it's very appealing to people, religions of works that say to people, you have to take a pilgrimage to this city. You have to crawl on your knees to this holy place. You have to do such and such. And if you do that, well enough, then God will honor you and God will allow you to earn your salvation. That's what people want. People want to earn their way to heaven. You can't do that. Next Sunday, for our baptism service, I'm speaking on the subject, what can wash away my sins? Verse 14, so Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child that he was healed. He was healed. What can wash away my sin? As the song says, the hymn says, nothing but the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1, 7 says that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus Christ died on the cross for sins that he never committed. Jesus didn't have any sins. Jesus did what no other human being has ever done. He lived a sinless, perfect life. And he died on the cross for my sins, for your sins. And he says, if you'll believe, and receive, do what I ask you to do, I'll heal you from the disease called sin. I'll save you from its penalty. Uh, I want to save you from its power in your life, and one day I'll save you from its presence. So Naaman got healed, not by the Jordan River. He got healed because he did what God told him to do. And he dipped seven times in the Jordan. And there was nothing magical. The reason he got so mad, by the way, about having to do that was because the Jordan River was muddy and dirty. It wasn't a clean river. And he was saying there are cleaner rivers back where I come from in my homeland. And his servant said, look, just do what the prophet of God said. If you want to get well, then do what God says. If you want to be saved from your sins and go to heaven someday, then do what God says. It, people say that's too easy. God says, that's what I want you to do. Repent and be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, let me give you the big idea. And that's on the top of your notes. The big idea to this message is that Jesus died for all peoples of the world. I need to see people as God sees. How many of you ever sang in Sunday school the old little, little Sunday school song, Jesus Loves the Little Children? Have you ever sang that? Yeah. Jesus loves the little children. 
all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Now, if you and I really believe that, and it's true, that's a true Bible principle. Not just the children, he loves everybody. Then, to minister in Jesus' name, we need to get past the hindrance or the barriers that the devil puts up in front of us to keep us from being good witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. So I named some, and there are many more. This story teaches us that we need to get past the hindrance of the barrier of race. I already noted to you that the Israeli slave girl had been kidnapped, carried away from her homeland by Syrians. She could have hated and despised her master, Naaman, and his wife because of prejudice, couldn't she? And because of what they had done to her. But she did not. In John 4, 9, the woman of Samaria said to Jesus, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. See, in John chapter 4, on purpose, Jesus said, I have to go through Samaria. Guess what? The Jews in that day didn't go through Samaria. They went around it. Because they didn't have any, quote, dealings with the Samaritans. They hated one another. But Jesus, on purpose, went through Samaria to speak to the woman at the well, a loose, immoral woman of another race, so he could bring salvation to her. Remember what happened to Peter in Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, God gave a vision to Peter. Remember what the vision was about? Of a sheet coming down from heaven? And the sheet had all kind of animals in it. And in the vision, God said to Peter, Get up and eat. Kill one of those animals and eat. And Peter said, man, those are unclean animals. Three times it happened. God said, don't call one clean what I've made clean. Right after that, the vision was over and a knock came on the door. Who was at the door? It was soldiers from Cornelius, a Roman centurion, another pagan nationality. And in Acts 10, 28, Peter said, it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or associate with you, but God has shown me. I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. And so, once again, Peter is told by God not to call unclean what he God had called clean and was helped to go see Cornelius, the Roman centurion. Bring salvation to him and his household. Did you ever stop and think about the fact that the problem in the human race is not as Years ago, a black evangelist wrote a tract. It's not sin, it's not skin, but it's sin. The problem is the human race is not skin, it's sin. Because when you cut open any human being's skin, What colors the blood? Oh, wow, amazing. And he has made Acts 17.26. Paul said, God has made from one blood every nation of, the, of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. God made of one blood.
Somebody made a good point here. God removed prejudice. Why don't we? That's correct. That's the point of this sermon. See, that's the deal. We have our hearts. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. How about age? Does anybody discriminate against anybody else because of age? Absolutely. The little girl was a young preteen, early teenager. She could have been disrespected because of her youth, right? What's a little what's a little girl, what's a little slave girl know about leprosy and about, you know, somebody that's a general helping him out? They could have just disregarded what she said. Here's one thing, though, that I've learned about sickness. When people are terminally ill, they get desperate and are willing to try almost anything to be well. I would suggest that people who are terminally sick spiritually should do the same thing as it relates to not being too proud to accept God's way of salvation, even though it seems too simple. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul told Timothy, let no man despise your what? Your youth. Let no man despise your youth. You know why? Because Paul knew that older people tend to look down on young, younger people and not listen to them. You and I would certainly never be guilty of that, right? Even though we think we don't, you ask anybody younger than yourself whether you do or not, they'll probably tell you, you want to know the truth? <laughs> in fact, it's so bad in the, in the culture that when I started as a young evangelist preaching, I was only 20 years old. And I would get in these churches and revival meetings with my sweet wife, Jeanette, and people would say to me sometime afterwards, you know, I, be, I was 21 then. They'd say, young fella, we were just talking back here. We were wondering how old you are, you know. It doesn't really matter, but, you know, we were just kind of curious. And, and God fortunately gave me wisdom beyond my years because I had a stock answer that I, I gave everybody. And by the way, I was not ashamed of my age but I knew it wouldn't be helpful for them to know I was only 20 or 21, right? As a preacher of the scriptures, as an evangelist. So I would just smile and I'd say, well, folks, thank you very much for telling me it doesn't really matter because since it doesn't really matter, then you're not going to mind if I don't tell you, would you? And I would just smile and just walk away. Because people look down on young people. God used the shepherd boy named David to kill the giant Goliath when all the other older soldiers weren't willing to do it, didn't he? God used the small lad who gave his lunch to Jesus and he fed 5,000 people. We should never look down on anyone because they are too young or too old. In fact, in Scripture, God commands younger women to be taught by the older women. Titus 2, 2 through 6, teach the older men to exercise self-control, be worthy of respect, live wisely. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way honors God. These older women should train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. In the same way, encourage young men to live wisely. What about gender? They could have looked down at that little girl because she was a girl. And by the way, in many nationalities still in the world today, they mistreat women. They, they treat women as second-class citizens. And there's too many. I'm, I'm not afraid to name the religions, but there's too many religions that do that. Did you ever stop to think that Christianity is what liberated women? Yeah. It did. I'll show you. Matthew 19, 4 and 5. Jesus said, haven't you read the scriptures? They recorded that from the beginning, God made them male and female. By the way, there's just two genders as far as God's concerned. And he said, this explains why man leaves his father and mother, has joined his wife, and the two are united into one. 
Galatians 3, 26 and 28. Watch this. You are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And by the way, that verse is not just about gender. That verse is about nationalities as well, isn't it? See, the ground is truly level. Metaphorically speaking, spiritually speaking, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. People discriminate against people and look down on them because they're, watch this, too rich? Too rich. Because they're too poor? I was talking to Jeanette last night about my message. I was just sharing it with her and getting her input and ideas. And she said, remember that time you and I went to this Bible study? And I said, yeah, you're right. Unless you are rich, you probably don't necessarily feel uh, comfortable is the, the kindest, best word to use. Comfortable witnessing to rich people, ultra rich people, because you kind of tend to think that, well, they have all this stuff, you know, and certainly they wouldn't be interested in the gospel. It was really neat. Uh, Some time back, she and I were invited to a Bible study. Uh, the head of this ministry was running in his home, and we didn't realize it when we went to it. It was a, it was a dinner Bible study that all the people that were there were way up here in the culture, in the society. They were all upper class professional people. And it was truly a neat uh, testimony to Jeanette and me to see how these believers didn't let that stop them from being a witness to their neighbor. You see, Everybody needs the Lord, no matter whether they're rich or poor. In fact, no offense is intended, rich people, but sometimes rich people need the Lord more because they think they have everything money can buy and they're still miserable. So don't ever hold back on witnessing because you think, well, that person wouldn't be interested. There's also a barrier of unconcern. You know, it's not my concern. Why should I care about those people? Well, let me share with you. It's hard to care about people in prison until you find yourself there or someone you love is there. It's hard to care about somebody in a nursing home until someone you love is there or you know someone who's there. Jesus, in Matthew 25, said these words. The king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father and inherit the kingdom. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me to your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing. When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, Matthew 25, 40. You should, if you don't have this verse marked in your Bible, you ought to mark it. Say, God, apply this verse to me now. Show me how this applies in my life. And, it, and everybody applies it differently. I understand that. I got that. Okay. When you did it to one of the least of this, my, these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. There are people in prisons that never, ever, ever get a visitor. But wait, let's not stop at the prison. There's people in nursing homes that never, ever, ever have one visitor come and see them. You know why? Because it's not my problem, see? We're not concerned. That's a huge barrier. Also, the barrier what I call non-involvement. Let somebody else do it. Let somebody else do it. That's why the number one person that's a volunteer in all churches is the person with the name needs someone. 
all churches, not just small churches like ours, big churches. I've seen that name on church bulletin boards across the country under nursery. Need someone. I thought, well, that person was really doing a lot of work. Need someone. Need someone. When Rosina Hernandez was in college, she attended a rock concert at which a young man was brutally beaten by another person. No one attempted to stop the beating. The next day, she was horrified and amazed to learn that, they, that the man had died because of the beating. Yet neither she nor anyone else had raised a hand to help him. She never could forget the incident or her responsibility as an inactive bystander. So some years later, she saw another tragedy. A car driving in the rain ahead of her suddenly skidded and plunged into Biscayne Bay. The car landed head down in the water with only the tail end showing. In a moment, a woman appeared on the surface shouting for help and saying her husband was stuck inside. This time, Rosina waited for no one. She plunged into the water, tried unsuccessfully to open the car door, then pounded on the back window as other bystanders stood on the causeway and watched. First, she screamed at them, begging for help. Then she cursed them, telling them there was a man dying in the car. First one man, then another, finally came to help. Together, they broke the safety glass and dragged the man out. They were just in time. A few minutes later, it would have been all over. The car sank into the water. The woman thanked Rosina for saving her husband. And Rosina was elated because she had promised herself she would never again fail to do anything she could to save a human life. She'd made good on her promise. John H. Holcomb said the, these words, you must get involved to have an impact. No one is impressed with the win-loss record of the referee. Think about it. No one is impressed with the win-loss record of the referee. you got to get in the game. Galatians 6, 9, let us not be weary in well-doing. In due season, we'll reap if we faint not. Finally, in closing, there's a barrier that is probably the number one barrier stops us from witnessing, and that's a barrier of fear. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare, but ever trust in the Lord will be safe. When he was preparing for his book, Good News is for Sharing, Leighton Ford, who was Billy Graham associate, talked to a lot of people. And he asked them about that, what made them hesitant to share their faith. Here are some of the fears that people told him. I'm afraid I might do more harm than good. I don't know what to say. May not be able to answer tricky questions. I might seem bigoted. I might invade somebody else's privacy. I'm afraid I might fail. I'm afraid I might be a hypocrite. The most common fear, though, is that of being rejected. When they gave a survey to people attending a training session for a big Billy Graham crusade in Detroit, one question they asked, what's your greatest hindrance to witnessing? 9% said they were too busy to remember to do it. 28% felt the lack of knowledge. 12% said their lives were not what they should be. The largest group was 51% whose biggest problem was the fear of how other people would react. None of us like to be rejected, ridiculed, or regarded as an oddball. So what's your biggest fear? What keeps you from witnessing? Psalm 118.6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you with my righteous right hand. Howard Hendricks said this, In the midst of a generation screaming for answers, Christians are stuttering. <laughs> In communist China, they have nationally approved churches called the Three Self Church. That's a state-approved church. They're allowed to sing hymns, read the Bible, pray, preach sermons, give Bible teaching, but they're not allowed to evangelize. That's part of the deal with the state. They can do their thing as long as their thing doesn't include evangelizing or persuading someone else. 50 million Christians in the People's Republic of China have chosen not to be a part of the Three Self Church. And they meet in house churches because they're convinced you can't be a Christian unless you evangelize. They say the two go together. 
If you don't evangelize, these Chinese people believe you're not a Christian. The reason they say that is because they believe the Bible teaches, why call ye me Lord, Lord, Luke 6, 46, and do not do the things which I say. I want to do a quick uh, word study with you. The word Lord, give me some synonyms for it. It's not on the screen. I'm not going to give you the answers. Give me some synonyms for what Lord means. Master, give me a modern one from today. Boss, let's stop right there. Okay? That's what it means. Boss. If you have an employer tomorrow, how many of you would have the audacity to go into work where your employer is, and say, hey, boss, I'm not going to do what you tell me anymore. He would say to you exactly what Jesus said in that verse. Why are you, why are you calling me boss if you don't want to do what I'm telling you? Why do we call Jesus Lord if we don't want to do what he said? Dr. Tony Campolo tells of a time he was walking down Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. There was a filthy bum. That's probably not the politically correct word, but that's what he was. There was a filthy bum covered with soot from head to toe. Tony said he had a huge beard. I'll never forget the beard. It was a gigantic beard with rotted food stuck in it. He held a cup of McDonald's coffee, mumbled as he walked along the street. He spotted me and said, hey, mister, you want some of my coffee? I knew I should take some to be nice, so I did. I gave it back to him and said, you're being pretty generous giving away your coffee this morning. What's gotten into you? You're giving away your coffee all of a sudden. He said, well, the coffee was especially delicious this morning. I figured if God gives you something good, you ought to share it with people. Tony says, I figured that's the perfect setup. I said, is there anything I can give you in return? I'm sure he's going to hit me up, he says, for $5. The bum says, yeah, you can give me a hug. I was hoping, he says, for the $5. He put his arms around me. I put my arms around him, and then I realized something. He wasn't going to let me go. He was holding on to me. Here I am, an establishment guy, and this bum is hanging on me. He's hugging me. He's not going to let me go. People are passing on the street. They're staring at me. I'm embarrassed. But little by little, my embarrassment turned to awe. I heard a voice echoing down the corridors of time saying, I was hungry, did you feed me? I was naked, did you clothe me? I was sick, did you care for me? I was the bum you met on Chestnut Street, did you hug me? For if you did it unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. And if you failed to do it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you failed to do it unto me. Are there prejudices that you and I need to confront in our lives? Are we prejudiced against people because of their race, their color, their creed, their age, their wealth? Let's ask God to make us like that little Israeli slave girl and give the message of life to people regardless of who they are. Because Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. And since they are, they should be precious in your sight and in mine. Let's close with prayer. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ yourself personally as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to do that right now. If you'd like to do it, just bow your head and quietly from your heart to God's, you can pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know I cannot save myself. Thank you, you don't ask me to do a hard thing to be saved. You ask me to humble myself and repent of my sins and believe in your son, Jesus. So I do that now. I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life. 
I want him to be my Lord, my boss. Run my life. Thank you for hearing my prayer, forgiving my sins, and giving me eternal life. Help me now to live my life for you. In Jesus' name, I pray. With our heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer a minute, God heard you. The Bible says, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you prayed with me a minute ago, would you lift your hand right now by your raised hand? You're saying, yes, I prayed that prayer with you, and I accepted Jesus Christ today as my Lord and Savior. Here's my hand. I'm not ashamed of Jesus and what he did for me. Now, maybe everybody here has done that. Let me ask you this convicting question, and I ask it myself before I even preach. Is there any person that you have not witnessed to simply because of a fear of, or of something in relation to that person? And you don't need to tell me who it is, but God may be reminding you of somebody that you know you could and should give a witness to, but you haven't done it. And there's something that's holding you back, some barrier some hindrance, some obstacle. And you'd say, Pastor Bill, please pray for me that I'll let go of those hinders, hindrances and barriers and obstacles and let God speak through me to those that he wants the gospel to go to. Here's my hand as a Christian. Yes, God bless you. Thank you. Many hands. Ask God to show you that everybody has a soul for whom Christ died, no matter how rich, how poor, or what their race, or what their age. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you, you cared for our soul. Somebody witnessed to us. Now help us to be willing to take the gospel. Bless these dear folks who raised their hand. Help them to have the, the, the courage to overcome their fear and the hindrance that is there in their life. And be the witness for you that you want them to be. In Jesus.